just to make it clear, uh, we're not playing bingo here. Okay? <laughs> Scared me, all of these people here. How many of you have been? I'm very particular. I'm trying to get a hold of like a hand. I'm very chosen. I don't know. Don't you have been? Who's your man? Like, just have a chance to meet him. Oh, have a chance to meet him. Now, I'm not sure. Get to know him. I'm not sure. Oh, my God, I'm not good. Hello, my relatives, and again, welcome here to uh, uh, the Dream Drum perspective as it relates to uh, some of the things we're wishing to accomplish up in uh, uh, Papua, Montana. Uh, <coughs> that's where we're from. But uh, we have uh, one of our mentors here with us that uh, has kind of been guiding us and bringing us along. Nietzsche uh, Ole. He's uh, originally from Standing Rock uh, area and uh, he's a teacher down there of the language. Uh, but he has helped us understand the importance of uh, some of these tools and the, the implements that we, we utilize as it relates to developing our character, not only as a Kjewi Chasha, but uh, also as singers and dancers and announcers and all that good stuff. And, uh, we realize the importance of uh, kind of developing one's character. You hear that quite often. Huh? You, you'll hear that, and, and a lot of people don't understand what that means. A lot of our contemporary younger folks don't understand that. And so, through what we understood about the drum, we realized the importance of the protocol that was instilled Lila a long time ago by a, a young lady named um, Eagle Tail Woman, Wambli uh, Sintay Queen. And uh, she brought that forward with the understanding that uh, this drum carries a, a medicine within it that relates to the Wankian Uyapiki, the, or the thunder beans, and uh, it works with them to, pro to provide us with an understanding of this healing process as we realize the importance of our connection to Mother Earth. And again, uh, we was talking with the young lady this morning. Uh, uh, in a contemporary way, we also refer to these gatherings as awa. But what they really are is a oshkate. Yeah? And, and it's a celebration. It's a celebration of life to humble ourselves to uh, this higher power, this wakhankakha, this uh, spiritual energy that uh, helps us to humble ourselves in a good way, but a ichye. And as we do that, we, we realize that uh, our connectedness to the Mother Earth is, is important. And the drum provides us an opportunity to maintain a respectful connection with the Mother Earth as it relates to our existence or our purpose and dedication in life. And uh, for many of you, you realize that in each of your families, there's usually just one that will kind of represent uh, not only themselves, but their family, their tribe, their community, and indigenous people all over the world as it relates, as it relates to Wola Kota Makasi Tomani, and uh, kind of like peace all over the universe. And that one person, they're, they're depending on them to understand certain things as they go throughout living their life, pursuing their purpose and dedication. And as we do these things, we realize the humility or the humbleness uh, with these, utilizing these elements or these tools like the drum that gives us that understanding of the medicine that's provided for us for this healing, this celebration of life. And so in a good way, we are here to help, help us all come together in a good way as different tribes, different families, different societies represented here today to uh, kind of realize that there's a foundation, there's a basis for some of the uh, decisions or choices we make sometime in a, in a fast-paced world like you see today. A lot of them call it powwow. It's, it's not really a powwow per se. It's a oshkate. And until we slow down enough, until we realize the importance of the protocol, we're going to kind of overrun it and then eventually we'll have to stop and go all the way back and relearn what we left behind. And so that's the purpose of this today. What we did uh, is uh, we utilized
utilized a, a book, a reference uh, that was called the, uh, the Danstrom of the Ojibwe. And in that, it mentions some of the story or some of the history of Wamlis and Dewey and how she wanted to utilize uh, uh, this drum and, and the manner in which we vocalize this, uh, uh, in a sense, Wojcikia, in that heartfelt cry that we utilize to, on behalf of represent, representation of ourselves, but on behalf of others, so that they can realize their purpose and their dedication. And, and uh, Eagle Tail Woman was uh, provided with a vision to bring that forward, and uh, that, that's the, what we'll be sharing with you today, uh, the importance of the protocol, the importance of not telling you anything, but sharing with you, okay? I think that's uh, important to understand because in that sense, we can remain apolitical and apersonal. Does that make sense? Hey. So when, when we say those things, we share with our people that I have a basic fundamental understanding of this uh, natural law value system that we live our life by. Even in a contemporary fast-paced world where we gotta compete with everybody else to pay our bills, drive a nice car, live in a nice home, all that good stuff. We've got to keep up with them. But it's important to realize the transition it takes to go from that fast-paced world to a more natural law, provided way of life that's a little bit slower, that helps us to understand the importance of uh, who and what we are as Dakota, Lakota, and Nakona people. And so that's what we're wishing to help you understand and, and realize the importance of that because uh, oh man, the way things are going, uh, you know, in a sense, the COVID is really, uh, there's, a, there's a silver cloud in, in that, in that uh, dark cloud of what they refer to as COVID. It helped us to understand to slow down now, uh, kind of take it a little bit slower because I think we're going too fast and we're leaving behind a lot of these qualities and characteristics of what initially was intended for, and that's what we're gonna try to share with you today based on the medicine that's provided to us. We created one of the first drums. Uh, we made a first drum out of a whiskey barrel. It was helping us and guiding us, and you get that whiskey drum, and we cut it in half, and then there's all that residue of that whiskey in, in the inside, so we had to sand that all out, and my older brother was kind of looking in that drum and that dust was coming up and smelling it. He got drunk. <laughs> Just smelling those fumes, it must have triggered him. Then right away he went to fight us. And after that, he's going to start crying. Oh, I love you, I love you. I hope you know. Then he was trying to cook up after that, put two wieners in a frying pan. <laughs> he woke up, the house was all smoky. <laughs> Some of the stages of what we, that learned behavior had brought us to, but uh, yeah, that was him. Not me, that was him. The fumes got him started. Oh. 30 days later, we found him somewhere behind that one place. Uh, <laughs> next, in class. <laughs> But you know, in a good way, we come here to not tell you anything, but just to share with you some really good things as it relates to what it means to be a contemporary uh, First Nations person that uh, a lot of us live by the, the natural law process, the value system that exists there, and, and utilizing these, these tools that have been provided for us and the respect that they're really due, and my older brother will share that with us. So with that, you know, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, Introduce uh, Chim Tawaniche Ole. Some of you may know him as Erwin B. Bullhead, uh, but I know him as older brother, and uh, I always try to help him out the best I can, and so I tease him like that. And uh, but he don't drink. Fifty some years or something like that, he doesn't drink. But uh, I was wondering how come if he don't drink, what does he act like that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, my relatives, again, Diana, 
This is my older brother, Nietzsche Ole, Earl Ole. I had the opportunity a few months back to go to Boston, and I had lots of intentions buying a Celtics jacket, a Patriots jacket, but I didn't have much time because I spent the time with the priests, and in their meditation, they don't talk. They spend the day in prayer. And so I was kind of lost in that world for a while. They sang, so I tried to keep up with that, but their style was a little different than mine. So anyway, I learned a lot by understanding so many things we have in common, but we don't communicate them enough. In the beginning, you know, learning how to sing and learning how to deal with what was going on in my life, a lot of these told me stories helped me. And when I got on the airport in Minneapolis, when I switched planes, my son uh, designed this case for me. And uh, this is not a hair dryer. <laughs> and so suddenly in that world that you go in from reservation life into the contemporary life, right away you try to look cool, you know. And so this is how I was walking around the airport. We started this concept or this idea many years ago for myself, and that's what sobered me up. It's been a long time since I've been in a bar. Now I can walk in a bar, no problem. But there was one factor involved. We call it Ichiba. I was always bumping heads with my old lady. And she gets mad and don't call me an old lady. We know what does that mean? So I said, you're philosophy, I'm philosophy. I said, and so then from that day forward, I put my guard down. I do not argue with her. I do not go against anything she has to say. I accept it, and we're still together to this day. It's awesome. So Chasha Vena, you have to come to understand you learn how to wash dishes. Change diapers. If you come to that step, you are a house husband. <laughs> but though I was watching the Donna you show and they were talking about house husbands. So I had my apron on, still kind of wet. Just got through with the breakfast dishes, the little things I needed to get done. Sent the kids off to school, got them dressed, got the laundry ready. All of those things. I would never thought that I'd be doing that in my life. Because it's raised to be macho, you know. So anyway, so I sat down to watch and they start talking about house husbands. I said, well, yeah, I said, that's what I'm doing. They're talking about me. Psychiatrists, sociologists, they're all discussing what it's like to be in that role as a father. And I was learning that. And one of the questions that arises is, what do you do when there's a milk ring from a glass, a cookie crumbs on the table, and the breadwinner comes home and says, what you do all day, watch TV? You know, I didn't think that would happen. You know, one day, sure enough, it was a busy day, I didn't get to clean the table off, and my missus walked in. She looked at the table like that, and she said, What'd you do today? He says, I suppose you watch movies all day long. Get anything done today? She said, look at that table. Got a full mouth and cookie crumbs all over the place. What'd you do today? And so one of them suggested and said, you know, you can help. It popped in my mind and said, honey, I said, you can help. Transette, <laughs> Where'd you get that TV? <laughs> My 
rule as a Chasha and did not really understand a lot of those things came from the elderly people. And this uh, journey that I stepped onto, I went to uh, treatment four times before I could really grasp what it means to walk the railroad. And the only way it happened is my counselor, Lakuru Oblake, Mr. Gene Denel. And I learned how to cry, and I learned how to pray, which was really hard. You know, when you're raised in an environment where you're told to be a cowboy, and you toughen up, it's a rough world out there, you toughen up. Those things we were raised that way, to be competitive, the shaking hands, direct staring. It did, it, it was a, gotta find that balance. So he showed me that. And so walking through it, I was sitting in a talking circle and I couldn't believe the things that our women go through. And I thought about that and when I put my blisses through. And that lump started coming up here. Couldn't control it, it just kept trying to come up. Like a volcano trying to erupt and all those feelings that I kept inside, I was trying to fight it. I swallowed and drank water and trying to, trying to control it, but it just kept coming up, coming up, coming up. And my brother I adopted was raised in foster homes all his life. He turned to get buffed up. He looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I used to ask, tease him. I said, geez, when you go number two, how do you manage it now? And he started sharing his life, what happened to him. He ended up coming to treatment from prison. And he got to the point where I couldn't control it anymore. And so I was sitting there just shaking. And I looked at my counselor. And I, you know how we communicate. He looked at me and he used his lips. He looked at him like, like you, you know. So I stepped up and I walked him to his office. He put a tennis box on the desk, put, gave me a bucket, and he told me, he said, Che Tiakalo, Tokashni, Che Don't be afraid to cry, let it out. I looked at him and said, How does he know that? He said, There are bubbles going out right there. He's shaking pretty soon. Burst. Oh my goodness, thanks. I see when I sing I'm loud, but man, I cried so loud I couldn't believe it. But it all began to I began to understand the power of prayer. And it became part of my life to learning how to pray. I go to church, I sing in churches. There isn't probably one place I haven't sang and I've sang more. I've sang for suicides, made songs for all various occasions, weddings. And so I've had that experience in my lifetime. But there's no greater feeling of loss than when you lose your voice. I'm very happy here today to be able to share with you a song that I think pertains to what we're about to show you. And so I want you to listen and feel it and hope that it helps you. And the way it happened was there are many challenges, many confrontations out there that we have to go through as singers. And this lady, Hektawi was her name. This is Agnes Green. She is my Mrs. His grandma. She's a Lanji. And she used to visit her a lot. We go to her place and she talked to us about the history of the reservation. And that was very interesting because I learned a lot. She told us that the blue birds were bullies. She saw the rest of the birds away so they could eat everything. And so as my time progressed, we spent a lot of time with her. And she used to always encourage us that the only thing that we really have for each other is prayer. 
And so knowing that, when my missus, when Agnes stepped into the spirit world, my missus said, I want you to make a song for you, for grandma. And uh, this is a, a short notice, you know, all of a sudden she requested it. And I've been in situations where I had to come up with songs to honor people, like James Eater being nominated for a, for a Congressional Medal of Honor. That's in place, that's going to be happening. I had to make a song for that, for that honoring and for the pair. For her. And so I've been in that situation before in various places. So I had to think about what she used to do for us and what she used to tell us. And so I started thinking about it. And so she said, I want you boys to go over and sing grandma into the church. And we've done that for people. We use our hand drums and we brought her in. And the family, the son and his wife walked up to us and said, we don't want that here. And I was kind of shocked and I said, well, we were invited so I apologize, I didn't mean to offend anybody. She said, we don't want that here. And I was kind of shocked because he was raised on a reservation and his missus was Caucasian. So somewhere there, and I really felt bad about it, so we left. And one of my missus come back and she said, why are you looking so sad? I said, I don't know what happened. She said, you go ahead and make that song. She said, pray, get that song ready for grandma and sing it when they're laying her to rest. And so that evening, we sat around and kept talking about things, laughing about it, things she used to tell us. And so I started putting it into words. Now, the backbone of a family is your missus, so she said, you better start writing those things down because you're going to forget it. Ah, uh, I won't forget it, it's here. Well, believe it or not, I call my missus by the wrong name, so I know I'm suffering now. <laughs> What did you say? I said, what did I say? Who? I don't know her. <laughs> when I was working in Fort Peck, I got a phone call from, from uh, Eagle Butte. <coughs> and there's a veteran. I never met him, never got to see him. But he told his family he requested that I come and sing for his services. And his uh, last name was White Eyes. But he suffered from Agent Orange. And so I was very honored to drive down from Montana to go to his services. And after it was all over, I was approached by the family and they chanted the Makupi. And so I've gone to many, many places with this little Sometimes, you know, like things happen to it. I was smudging it with a candle and here I burnt the hide and somebody said, gee, how come you have shicha on the hide? Oh, I thought it was one of the last things burnt. So him and I have experienced a lot of things and this is a heartbeat for me. As long as it is, I compose a lot of songs on it. So bear with me. It's been a while since I sang this song, but you know, like she's right. So I start writing a lot of these songs down so I can memorize it. So this is going to be the first time that I've ever done this. And so Mike was supposed to record it, but I don't know where he went. So anyway, he missed out. <coughs> it's a wonderful thing you know, to be able to utilize what's available to us that's in our archives, and we're going to talk about that. But I want you to listen and kind of think about your relatives and the message that Spirit of Song says. And I hope that it helps many of you. But it's uh, it's very touching and it's an honor to sing it for you. <laughs> Oh, 
our heartbeat and becomes who we are. So I encourage you that don't be afraid to sing. You know, I started out singing at an early age because I didn't know any better. You know, when this renaissance began and there were meetings all over, you know, the first thing that I heard was 49 songs. Ah, damn. <laughs> Holy smokers. And I went up to Haskell so they sing 49, isn't it? And, uh, so at the beginning, when we, whatever the southern boys sang, we sang, but we sang them higher. So when they got through singing over there, then we started singing over here, all the northern tribes, you know? And so singing those songs like that, women dancing, and we tried a lot of times, it was fun, you know? Holy smokers, you stand in one, girl from some other tribe with a skinny little waist. <laughs> so, I brought this attention to it. How else can I bring attention to how to present our songs and then recognizing what was given to us in a very special way? We needed, our parents, our families needed protection from the state of Minnesota. Governor issued a bounty on our people. As tragic as it was, he offered bounties on our people. Can you imagine that? $200 a scalp, a child, no matter. So people came in just to do that. And so the coming of this dream drum, how it was brought to us, it was protection, it was unity, told us that it's gonna reunite a red nation, and that's us. It's gonna do it through song, dance, color. Moves our spirit. And so, I thought about it and I said, you know, what did they implement and what did they utilize back in those days? And number one was the first established drum was done on a mil abandoned military wash tub. They put a deer hide on it. Now, we chose to put elk on it here, but them days, they used Holstein cow hides. Everybody had a milk cow, or at least had access to one. You know, and it became a very precious thing to them. When that milk cow went down, man, there was water in that tone of that high is special, you know? And so what would they use for the frame? You know, they didn't have no saws that could do the job, and the nails that they had, you know, we got screws now, you know? But they had nails with square heads that temper off. Can you imagine trying to put one of those into hardwood, and all they had was just a saw to do all the cutting? and then getting the bands off of it. Of course, you know, everybody at that time through the industry shipped everything in barrels, wooden case. And that brings me to my question. I tried it yesterday, 20 slowly, actually. You know? So 
So I'm gonna ask you just to kind of keep you sharp. You all know what a keg is, right? It's not a aluminum one, or perhaps a wooden one. You have a 10 pound keg. What do you put in it to make it weigh nine pounds? Here we go. I knew it. A one pound hole. Huh, okay, another one. I had the opportunity to speak to uh, producers and actors and all that stuff and Kind of makes me feel proud sometimes because I got a hug and kiss from Andrew Hall and Jolene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so many people can say that. She shook my hand and she said, I think you're such a comedian. They asked me to explain the song prior to the movie called Ishi, The Last of His Tribe. And so when I stepped out on that stage, you couldn't see nobody out there. Those lights are just bright and standing out there. I said, it's customary amongst our people to make people feel welcome. Come on in, we'll call up with the chan. chance. We have that. And so I said, I'd like to make you feel comfortable. I said, and that's humor. I said, what do you call a rural rabbits that take a step backwards all at the same time? No light bulbs again, huh? A receding hairline. Oh. <laughs> well, you guys are sharp today, boy. <laughs> you know, it's Halloween time. You thought that you no teeth in the front and I'm good. So the process in which we started this, I really enjoy what we did because it involved students and involved a special, special, unique experience that there was somebody there whose relatives was mentioned in that reference that we use. The dance drum of the Jibwa. I didn't know nothing about it, but there were many questions I needed to answer as learning to be a singer, the responsibility. Where'd that drum come from? How did they make those drums back in the day? What did they utilize? And so I began in quite Coincidental, sitting at a powwow, I met a, a gentleman that spoke Dakota. His name was Louis Garcia. I don't call him Louis Garcia, I call him Dewey Garcia, Big D. And that's the other thing, when I moved to Fort Dutton, I had to pick up on the dialect too. So I play around with the Nakona, now go ahead. These guys all speak Nakona. And also, you hear it and you make analogies and say, oh yeah, 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 there's similarities, we understand each other. All it is is dialect differences. So it's very enjoyable to meet people like that. And so having these guys company, sometimes I just kind of have to shake my head and say, I think I got what they're trying to say. So. I help them as much as possible. And so I decided, I said, well, I'm going to call him and take him, see what I can do about that. And so I called Tommy. I said, you ever thought about putting a presentation together to educate our young? Educate those people that, how would you say, never thought about it. To this day, I still got to remember, I went to a celebration of not at tribes, and they sang the flag song, Porcupine Singers, Oloa and Kawapa Oloa Hia. So I asked this guy beside me, I said, Hena Oloa Mhitak Shakabe. And he said, Slohash ni Lokola. He said, As Tokashi Nuhat Takomi Slohen Chijin. So I went to an elder person, I said, Hitak Shayeki Khoi, Hitak Shakabe. And he said, Slohash ni Lokola. So here we have all these people in Ajibna and they honor our, our flag to a song, but yet it was to respect the gesture because of their military background or relatives that were in the service. 
And so that made me curious. So popcorn boxes, napkins, any form of something I could write on, I would start writing words down that songs that I had. And so I got a whole box of them laying in the house and I haven't touched it. I've been very fortunate, right? And people recognize that and they would bring me collections. I got the Rhodes collection, I got the Walker collection, I got the Densmore collection, and so many other tapes that were brought to me. But I'm still old school. I haven't learned how to digitize things yet, so I'm looking forward to that. And I also have the Denzelmore collection. And so each moment, my thoughts have always been, how can I keep going and get this out to the young? And so I sing for them, and they like to dance. As young as they are, I they take it out, you know? It's the bullet, and I said, oh, cheat that. So yeah, and so I sing a song, they get down and dance around. And so I knew then, I said, well, it's a vehicle other than the voice. And so that's when this idea of this drum, to teach them about the heartbeat of a nation, that's us. So it began. And so we all got together and we started thinking about it. And so it became a reality. And it was very enjoyable to see those students working on that crap. And all I had to do was supervise. I didn't have to do manual labor whatsoever. Because that's a lot of hard work scraping a high. I know some of you have done that. And I'll give you a secret. I wish I knew this a long time ago, but there's a lady in Fort Peck that Tom was telling me about. She uh, tends highs, but when not, she got ruhuyans on her. She's getting rheumatism, so she can't scrape the highs like she used to. Right? So Tom asked, well, how do you manage to tan highs? So she got a high-powered water sprayer, and she would spray that on the fat and the color on the high over a tree trunk or, or a branch, and get all that taken off it. Well, yeah, I should have thought of that a long time ago, you know? The Juan made scrapers and all this stuff, and pulling out that your arms look like Popeye after a while. And so, you learn something every day. So those of you who are ever going to do that, think about that. Just think, you just plug it in and put a hose on it, and shh, get the eye down in no time. Take the hair off the fat and the meat. But it's still a good experience to do it by hand. So this procedure in, uh, of constructing this drum, it was very, very unique because Elijah found out where we can get these. It's a barrel. So we cut it in half, and we have another chance to carry it on and let more students learn how to make it. And so stretching it on that, there's a certain elasticity to that. If you make it too tight, he's on the key. You gotta try to sing way up there. Sound like Mickey Mouse and Mindy. Hi, Mickey! <laughs> if you got too low, you sound like Elvis, you know. So you have to know what that is. I use a ruler and I lay it over the top and depending on the distance between the bottom of the ruler and the skin, I can judge where I want it to go. So you got cow hides, buffalo hides, elk hides, bear hides, all the variety of different hides that you can use, but putting them together, I can pretty well judge where the best sound is gonna be, but you cannot beat the milk cow hide. It's just natural sounds good. So we're gonna present this, and we have not struck it yet, all right? And we'll do that in Fort Peck. So this drum has already traveled, and that's how it was done many years ago. When it was first brought, people in the community, surrounding communities, wanted this to become part of their community. It took 12 days. Four days were used to sing the songs and to talk about each song and what it was going to do for our people. The protection, the healing, the medicine that's associated with the songs. And so, they would sing together. 
The next four days, they would listen. The singers who brought the drum, they would listen to the new ones of earning it. And so they get the songs right. And the last four days, all right, they would present the whole drum ceremony on its own, and it's all over. In Minnesota, they call it the drum ceremony. Down in uh, Topeka, they came to my house one time. This drum committee, and they brought me some green stuff. And I didn't know what it was, because the first thing that I did was I opened that warm, and I, I thought maybe it was bringing me some peji, you know? <laughs> but I didn't know any better. And all that time was that their tobacco. And they were bringing it to offer and have me work with them with their, because I knew how to read and write. And all that time, it was associated with that big drum. So in the beginning, there was no utensil on the drum. You know how today, they hit it, the drum, and then they come down with four. What's going on? They got that, they get carried away with that now. Twenty times, he can turn it on there and sing it. It hush and sum me out. They said, you're taking it too far. And so the first thing I asked them, I said, do you want a beer? And they said, no, 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 no. They never came back again. They were asking me. So I, you learn as you go. So that drum traveled to all these communities. And the same process took place. And so now what was going to, to reunite Red Nation is not only on this continent, but it's gone abroad too. They have hobbyists over there, they have big powwows and everything. You know, so it's touching the world, especially with what we have now, with all the technology. Some of the essential understandings are being taught in Africa, and we taught in Australia. So we're touching, that heartbeat is touching the world. So, I want you to understand that the responsibility of being a drum creeper, not creeper, keeper. <laughs> Halloween's coming around the corner. I'm uh, not clock. I'm getting scared now. And so, being on that drum, one advice was if anything's important, it'll come to the drum. So the years that I started singing, singing on that, sitting and watching, taking care of that drum, all right, there are many, many things that come to the drum. You know, I've had to translate names, sing songs, ask me where it's from. So it was just part of the gift. They get me coffee or they get me something to eat. And that, that's enjoyable, you know, but I don't expect it, it just comes. So the process began. Kokeaki Naji, Kevin Locke, a fruit terrible dancer extraordinaire. He came to my house and he brought me a bunch of cassettes. And it was the Densmore collection. He said, Oh, I like Kolak Hash. He said, I know you're going to do something with this someday. And I was surprised. So I started listening to it. To tape number one but it didn't match up with the chronological order because I was trying to learn Sundance. I just got out of treatment. I needed something to buffer what I was doing. So I was looking for that spiritual aspect of our people, learn the songs or whatever it takes. So I was looking at the Denzelmore collection, but those songs just didn't match up. And so I, what am I going to do? Uh, I put it through synthesizers, I put it through equalizers, and trying to figure out what are they, what's this, does it match up? And so, Abrushta, I gave up on it. Couldn't figure it out. I saw a couple of years trying. Then I went off to college, went to school. And in that process, lo, they call it, Tokashila intervened. I'm walking down the street behind Chester Fritz 
And when we were little kids, we used to jump up in the air, stick out our tongue and try to catch that big snowflake. Did you ever do that? When we were kids have a contest, well, let's see if it's the last contest. <laughs> Laugh at each other, fall over, Okishi, you know, each other walking, you know. It was fun. When you study, your brain gets watery. And you kind of get Ganashkina, you know. And there's a big snowflake coming down. And so all of a sudden, I ran, I jumped, I stuck my tongue out, trying to catch that snowflake. Here comes another one, trying to catch that one. Students stopped looking at me, probably thought I was losing it, you know, or drugs or something, you know. And then the way that snowflake was coming down, the word ia came in. And the way it left is iaya. So when you put those words together, iaya means to go. They say, ho iaya, go. And ho iaya, it's left. So one is current and one is future, you know? And I thought about that and I said, hey, this fits in that song I'm listening to. It. So I played hooky, went back to my apartment, and I put everything up, and I started putting those words into that song. And so this is what it sounds like. It's called a song of departure. All right? So just, you'll hear the words as they go in. to be that protector and knowing what you 
doing when you're studying songs. Know where they come from. Know how they're used. And there's no greater gift to hear your work and use amongst our people. I was working on a sound system with Chris at the Ulala, Fair Rodeo, and his boys sang an honor song for Chico. And they sang a song that I translated and recorded. And man, you talk about goosebumps. I sat back and closed my eyes, and man, I saw it so nice. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. The work is well done. Talking to myself. And then the next drum that came up, called Showtime. He sang a song that I translated. Right away, my foot started going, Mija, 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 Mija. I wanted to dance right there and made it sound so good, you know? So that experience is our reward for the work that you do. So stay humble. You know, it works out. So we're about to now yesterday, she challenged They gave us an hour. Now how much time have we utilized so far? We're supposed to stick to that, you know. The shan yesterday went for two and a half hours. You know? Then now she was going like this, but whoa, 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 whoa. So we want to keep it short so when you have good questions. So what we're about to show you, you can learn. I almost got ready. It's something that last night I suggested to I said the gentleman that put this together is very talented. If there's some way you can recognize it, he said, but this is just the beginning. There's other footage. There's other footage that's going to be put together. And he said, you can take it and put it on Facebook, uh, another one, Hotspot or something like that. And I said, I don't know about TikTok, I said down here. <laughs> so that was my suggestion. But hopefully that's all going to turn up and see how the public accepts it. So uh, I hope you. Uh, Get a message from it and take it to your kids, take it to your children, and show them how things can be done with their hands. Our kids learn from physical activity, along with our color, our sound. So enjoy it. relationship with the family. So you don't want to dwell in that. So you don't become what they call a showcase. As a singer, we call it oha. Keeper of songs. The thing to do now is get as much 
down to that middle part. Send it down, outside. That belt, send your belt. Hey, that caretaker and that kind of people is an awesome responsibility. You gotta be very careful with the song. Amy songs, giveaway songs, thank you songs, kind of warning songs, closing songs, flag songs, different type, different song. You have to be knowledgeable about the song that you sing. I stayed 39 years old for six years because I didn't want to get old. And I'm going to learn the word for shalah. Which shalah means to uh, be knowledgeable, wisdom. Shalah is a blossom. So when I accepted that, come on, bring it in. I started giving my English. I was the first certified language teacher in North Dakota. kids the language through songs. I listen to Walter's advice. I'm on that age. He said, whenever people ask you to do something for them, they're depending on you. And so you're doing your best. Because there's a come a time when you get old, It's really a, a wonderful life that we can uh, work towards this mission our goals. And one of the words I used to always think about is the word Mamushila. And I said, where did that come from? You know, the love part at the end of the word is gen, uh, is a form of uh, how would you call it? Uh, it's like uh, making it very special. The women use it. You know, washtela. You know, wayang washtela. And for men to say it like that, I said, do I do that? You know, do I try it? So I start putting washtelo in there. Washtelo. And then I start getting the idea about femininity and masculinity. That our language is very important. Remember that our women use words different from men. Like for instance, the word ha. Men say do, wo, or yo. Ha is for feminine gender. I was walking down a hallway one time this girl come walking by. Anta! She said, Anta! I said, that's a man's word, you know? The lady should say, Chaviyah, or something nice like that, you know? But here's this young girl going, Anta! You know? <laughs> so we work with all kinds of those kinds of things, but one of the things I remember most of all, I'm not sure which high school it was, but I was walking down the hall in here. This young boy was putting a book on the top shelf, his locker, 
and this girl walked by and I got up here. You bent over and you turned around and said, she likes me. I said, geez, what's going on here? Man? We don't know how to express ourselves sometimes. And boy, was that hard for me. You've got to learn how to share your feelings. And so my counselor, Jean, said, don't forget. She said, you have to exercise it. Learn how to share the emotions. So my missus and I were in Grand Forks, home and economy, shopping. And I was thinking about that. I was walking, we had two carts. When she, when she go shopping to all them, and she went into a dollar store. We ran out, it's just a dollar store. She spent $400 in her. <laughs> I was thinking about that, and I said, this is a good time, ain't nobody around here. You know? So I walked up there, and I put my arm around her, and I said, Peggy, I said, I love you. I never said that to anybody before, except my mom. But uh, she pushed me away. She said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> that hurt my feelings, you know? I didn't know what to do, how to react, because they said, you got to learn to show your emotions. So I kind of walked away like this, and I didn't really talk to each other for a long time. And on the way back from Grand Forks, we just went past where that white buffalo calf was born. And there she said, Earl, I'm sorry. She said, but I need to go to treatment too. She's never drank in her life. If she has, I've never seen it. So she went. We've been together now a little over 50 years. As I was on, so I was on. You know, when you talk about your sobriety, they say that's grandiose behavior. So I kind of forgot how many years it's been so when I tipped that old brewski. When you see that foam coming down that glass, see your mouth starts getting saliva. When you develop the tools, you know, to combat that, you keep it in check. And it's, sometimes it's not easy, especially when you're under stress and all this stuff. And man, Having people that respect you and love you, you can't beat it. My oldest son, first time in his life, was allowed to eat a beef on his own. He was a silversmith on the way back from Orange County, California. A semi pushed him into the medium by Saunders, Arizona, and ran over a Chevy 10 pickup, and after impact, made it for 45 minutes and passed away. So that, and those steps and those things that hadn't been for that counseling, hadn't been for my missus and my friends to help them go through the sweat, on his staff. You know, when you do things for people in a good way, it's gonna come back to you. You know that. I had no was this guy as a student. I used to have to do arts and crafts to get to gas money to go home on weekends. And all I had to my name was about $10. I said, I don't know how I'm gonna make it to my son's funeral. I walked into the uh, Mariful Hall at UND campus where I taught language. And there was a pipe and a glass case put together. And so I went up to the director and I says, you know, that's inappropriate. If you're going to use a chanuk or a pipe, you need to, not going to use it, disassemble it. But now I said, who's using that pipe? And I've been sitting there for years. And so the word got around that I was concerned about it. And my secretary, Mary Kessling, who just recently passed away, I had to sing for her. That was hard. And the Alumni Association had a meeting and they asked me to come and smudge the whole basement of the Chester Prince Library. You should see that place. They have bones, they got artifacts, war bonnets, eagle feathers, collection of donations that was given to the school, either at Diggs or actually all of the Diggs. And there was a feeling there 
And so I went down there and we smudged everything and I sang for them and all that stuff. And I felt very good about it. And that was, they finally did something about it. And uh, somebody knocked on the door and there was the president of that alumni association, Mr. Bullhead. He went, I brought you a we alumni associate on behalf of alumni associate. We brought you a ticket to Elmer Creek. I looked at her and I said, I was, thank you very much. And I shook her hand and gave her a hug and I said, thank you. But I had to be, how would you say, tranquilized, given a shot because the trauma that hit, I became very uh, close to that breaking point where I just wanted to walk over to the liquor store and drown myself. Phone call rang, and it was my message. You stay where you're at. I said, They're coming. Okay, okay. And so, my friends, who I later adopted as my brother's dad, they took me into the sweat, showed me the Umuya, what to do. And so, I traveled from Grand Forks to Albuquerque. And I was getting off the plane, and there was a man standing there with a sign that had bullhead on there. And so years ago, they used to talk about the temperature being the hottest place in the United States called Bullhead City. So out of curiosity, I said, that's interesting. He said, are you Earl Bullhead? I said, yes, I am. He said, I'm here to drive you from Albuquerque to Gallup, New Mexico. One of his students became my brother to a hookah by Tom and I. And he was Miles Eller. He too passed away. He went and made it to Gallup. He said, have you eaten yet? I said, yeah. Now. He said, well, you better get something to eat, he said. So we pulled into this cafe. And while we're sitting there, people were going by and here. His voice said, Earl, is that you? I looked up in the air. He's a former princess of the United Tribes Power. I sang for her when she was crowned. She said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm looking for my son. I lost my boy. She said, you stay here. I'll be right back. So she drove me from there to the funeral where my son was. So when I say, be good to each other, thank you, I wish I got up all. Be good to each other, because you're gonna feel it, it'll come back to you in a good way. And I've experienced it over and over and over and over. You know, we teachers, we don't make a lot of money, you know. We make enough to get by. And I sang for a lady named Robin Red Eagle Baker. When I first went to Poplar, they asked me to sing for her, so the only song I knew was a positive thinking song, and maybe some of you heard it. It's on the Red Road, and so that was the appropriate song, so I sang it. She received $10,000 and a trip to Hawaii, round trip, for the eastern part of Montana. The western part of Montana, they selected someone else. And I thought that was, geez, man, that is awesome. And so as a teacher, I was given directions to watch a certain door, so I'm standing over there and watching the kids come out and help them stay in order. And these fourth graders are starting to come out, and this little chip on little boy broke the line from running towards me. And the teacher was trying to catch up, so I stopped her. He come running up to me and he looked me in the eyes and he said, Mr. Bullhead, put his hand out. I shook his hand. He said, I thought they were talking about you. I think about that and it makes an emotional response that I've done my work. If you ever experienced that, I won't let the college you recognize that I have kids in such a way 
We work hard, we do our job right, but our language will return. I want to thank all of you for coming. I tell you, my name is Mr. Kepi. You got good hearts, good minds. We go to each other. Look, Shaheed, Shaheed.